Hello, and welcome to the 48th annual AAKP National Patient Meeting, Transforming American Kidney Health. Patients take the lead. My name is Yolanda Moore. I'm an AAKP ambassador from the great state of Alaska. I am also a kidney partner, care partner to my loving husband, Gary, a kidney transplant recipient. I've been married to Gary for 36 years and we have seven children. Gary developed kidney failure as a result of unmanaged hypertension in 2012. I've been by his side as a care partner for a very, from the very start. As a newly appointed AKA KP ambassador, I am excited about the opportunity to assist other care partners in effectively meeting the needs of their loved ones and advocating on their behalf. Additionally, it is important to me to provide guidance in managing the stresses and become that come with being a care partner, ensuring that they do not experience burnout. It is crucial to recognize that care partners play an equally vital role in a patient's journey alongside doctors and nurses. My husband and I became members of AAKP and ambassadors to share the message that every kidney patient has the most important voice in determining their care plan. It is imperative that an environment is created that supports kidney disease, research, and innovations so that we are continually advancing care, improving treatments, and providing solutions for unmet patient needs. And all those innovations are FDA approved. It is crucial that all patients have access and the right to those treatments that is best for them. In con consultation with doctor, they choose to care for them so that every patient can live their best life and achieve their aspirations, such as having and supporting a family. It gives me great pleasure to moderate today's session titled Disease Management, How to Reduce the Risk of Falling. We are delighted to welcome our esteemed colleague and chair of AAKP's Medical Advisory Board, Dr. Stephen Fadum. Dr. Stephen Fadum is a highly re respected figure in the field of nephrology renowned for his exceptional expertise and contributions. Currently, he serves as a practicing nephrologist and professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Fadum has long been admired as one of the pioneers in recognizing the potential of the internet for patient education. His remarkable achievements have earned him numerous accolades such as the National Kidney Foundation's Distinguished Service Award, the AAKP Dr. Peter London Award, and the AAKP Medal of Excellence. Dr. Fadum's exceptional reputation is further solidified by the inclusion of America's top doctors, as well as being a two-time recipient of the Presidential Volunteer Service Award receiving a gold level in 2020 and the prestigious lifetime achievement in 2023. Dr. Fatum, we are privileged to have you with us today. I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Yolanda. And I wanna thank AAKP for the privilege of speaking with you today. And I wanna talk about a subject which I think is very, very important for all of us. The subject is falls. As you can see on this slide, we're going to be talking about understanding and preventing falls. And much of the information that I'm going to be talking about is from a book that I just finished writing that is now in publication and should be out in a few weeks. It's called Understanding and Preventing Falls, A Guide to Reducing Your Risk. Despite that, I'm still going to try to add some information about kidney disease as well to this talk. Okay, the most important thing 
for all of us is just plain don't fall. The most important thing I can say is be mindful of yourself. Be cautious wherever you are. Think that there may be the potential for you to fall. So pay attention to where you're stepping, to your environment. That is probably the most important thing you can do. One third of the general population falls each year. Second leading cause of unintentional deaths. It's very, very common. And there are about 684,000 people who die each year from a fall. 37.3 falls require medical attention. If you look at the World Health Organization, of all the people that fall, about 37% of them are gonna to have to go into the hospital. And falls occur for many, many reasons, but we can decrease the incidence and the severity of falls. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. As we age, we are more prone to fall. And also falls are common in patients with chronic kidney disease. What risk factors are there for falling? Well, principally age is a major risk factor. Also a prior history of a fall, frailty, which is a special condition that we're going to talk about, the failed walking test, in other words, the inability to walk well, poor muscle function, uh, bad nutrition, and vitamin D deficiency have been associated with falls, as has diabetes, heart and kidney disease, cognitive impairment, and the use of some medications. Where do people fall? A large review of a high risk population revealed that 82% of falls occur in the home. 69% are indoors, 57% when we're walking, 31% when we move from a sitting to a standing position, and 16% are in the bathroom. So this Venn diagram shows you there are mechanical falls and there are non-mechanical falls. The non-mechanical falls are due to health problems principally, whereas mechanical falls are things that we might be able to prevent. Now the caveat is that if you have risk factors that make you prone to a mechanical fall, they are more likely to occur if you have a non-mechanical situation. For di example, diabetes or dementia or dehydration or muscle wasting is going to make you more likely to trip and to fall on an uneven surface or to trip over a surprise step. So as we get older and as we lose some of our agility and our balance and our muscle function, we want to be aware of this. So let's talk first about non-mechanical falls. There are three major reasons for non-mechanical falls. The first reason is dementia, frailty, stroke, neurologic disorders, the second reason is medications. And the third reason is chronic diseases such as muscle wasting, balance disorders, visual problems. So let's talk about these for a minute. In the population that has frailty or cognitive decline, the most likely problems are related to a stroke, to dementia, or to some sort of neuromuscular disease. In the group that's over-medicated, sedatives and painkillers are the number one source. Next, we have medications for diabetes or high blood pressure. If you take too much of either of these medicines, your blood sugar may drop too low, or your blood pressure may be too low. If you're on sedatives, you may fall asleep or you may have a loss of attentiveness. So medications can be very important. 
And thirdly, trouble with balance gate muscle and with vision, visual disorders, heart trouble, diabetes, kidney and chronic diseases, cancer, muscle atrophy, the failed walking test, and poor nutrition are all major causes of falls in our population. So let's talk about frailty. I think this car is a pretty good example of frailty in the automotive industry. Uh, if you're frail, you're vulnerable. You don't have to be elderly. You can be young with a chronic illness. Or you can be, many people get frail for reasons other than age. We call the opposite of frailty being robust, by the way. If you lose body reserve, such as a severe case of COVID or cancer or something like that, diabetes, even at a young age, you may become frail. There are multiple causes and the main symptoms of frailty are three out of five of these. Number one, you just can't climb stairs anymore. No matter how hard you try, you just don't have the strength to go up a flight of stairs. You can't walk very far. We'll say a block. Uh, I'm in Texas, so blocks may be bigger, but you, you can't walk very far. You feel tired all the time. You always want to take a nap. Uh, you have a severe illness. COVID works, uh, but kidney disease works, but uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled kidney disease, heart failure, but you have a severe medical problem or severe liver disease, and you've had a 5% weight loss in the past six months. These are the signs of frailty. This is what constitutes frailty. Now, there are several ways that dementia can present. First, it's not just a mild memory loss. That's pretty normal as you get older. Forget where you put your keys or things like that, that does not make you demented. So many of us can relax right there. However, if we have severe memory loss where we can't recognize our family, or if we have a personality change where we can't reason, or we have a decline in mental function that interferes with our ability to get dressed in the morning, get out of bed or drive a car, these are the the things that we're concerned about. Frailty can be associated with Alzheimer's disease. In fact, it most likely is. It's a specific disease and it's, um, and, and it's associated with dementia. It's associated with frailty too. But Alzheimer's is probably the most common. Vascular diseases, however, can be associated with dementia, especially if you had chronic hypertension. You can have gait disturbances and balance disturbances with dementia. You walk differently. Dementia can be associated with Parkinson's disease, and it can be associated with aggression or uh, a loss of a filter, frontal lobe dementia. Or it can be the combination. It can be a combination of Parkinson's and frontal lobe dementia. So there are ways that our uh, brain can lose function. And any time our brain loses function, that can lead to dementia. A classic example in, in the news was Bruce Willis, who wasn't able to talk. He had aphasia, and that would have been a sign of dementia. Robin Williams, who had Parkinson's disease, was developing frontal temporal dementia. So falls occur in dementia because people lose a lot of control. They're common. There's an eightfold incidence over a 12 month period. And the prevalence of falls is severe. It leads to fractures. So you can imagine a demented uh, individual who can't control himself, who can't put his arms out or can't roll or can't do some of the recovery steps is just going to hurt himself or herself when the fall occurs. Stroke. Why am I showing a picture of a flea? I'm going to answer that in a minute. 
Strokes are a leading cause of death. They're 10 times more common in kidney patients. They're associated with atrial fibrillation and with high blood pressure. They can be very insidious and gradual and just associated with mild cognitive impairment that people barely notice. However, the fall risk is gonna to start to increase at this point. Or they can be associated with a number of strokes and after maybe several strokes, somebody will really be ill. Sometimes they're associated with gait disorders and sometimes they're associated with depression. So why do we have the word fleas? Fleas are how you can save somebody's life. Stands for, F stands for face. Show me your teeth, puff out your cheeks. If the person can do that easily, that's a good sign. But if they can't, that means they're suddenly developing a stroke. L, level of consciousness. Alertness, do you know where you are? Do you know your age? Do you know what day and month it is? Do you know whether you're able to walk? Are you neglecting one side? Are you sort of ignoring the fact that maybe your left or right hand is paralyzed? So are you oriented to space, not just oriented to time and not just oriented to where you are, like you might live in a certain city. Are you oriented to space, where you're standing and whether you're standing or not? And can you follow commands? Can you open and close your eyes? Can you squeeze the hand? That's all level of consciousness. Eyes, can someone follow your fingers? If they can't follow your fingers, that may be a sign of a stroke. Arms and legs are A. Can they move their arms and their legs and they, can they hold them up? And are they coordinated or have they lost their coordination? And the S is speech. Can somebody articulate and express himself or herself? The bottom line is if you come up with any of the fleas signs that we're talking about, the person should either go to the emergency room or the emergency room come to them. In some major cities, you call 911 and say, help, help, I think my friend is having a stroke. They will send a unit out that will actually do what they call a, a thrombolysis procedure right there on the spot and maybe open up the clot and prevent the stroke from getting worse and they can do it right then and there. Whereas sometimes you go into the emergency room and, and you're stuck in a traffic jam, and you have trouble getting to the emergency room door. Uh, sometimes you have trouble with the ambulance, but if you get the ambulance out there in a really big hurry, in some cities they have these stroke units. What about falls? After a stroke, a person is at the highest risk of falling. 37% of people who have a stroke are gonna fall within the first six months, 73% in the first year. Why do they fall? Well, they have vision problems, muscle weakness, muscle dysfunction, trouble with their balance, trouble walking. They may have cognitive decline and they may not have modified their home so these are the reasons why somebody may be falling. So how can we prevent all of this? How can we prevent falls, strokes, and dementia? Well, the first thing, if you see a loved one or a friend that's having any of these problems, that person probably needs an, an assistive device. And that would be uh, either a cane or a walker or a wheelchair, some sort of assistive device. We need to strategize the home to make it fall proof so that we protect from a mechanical fall. In other words, make sure there's no loose carpets on the ground that someone can trip over or a slippery floor in the bathroom. Ensure adequate nutrition. You'd be surprised how many people, when they get sick, they just don't eat very well. And that contributes very rapidly to muscle decline exercise programs. I cannot emphasize this enough. 
but exercising is critical to preventing a fall. And interventional mechanisms are associated with some improvement. So if we start early, when we see somebody who is having difficulties, we might be able to prevent them from falling and reduce the chances of them injuring themselves. So strokes are related to chronic kidney disease. And of course, chronic kidney disease is characterized by protein in the urine or a decrease in the filtration rate. And there are several risk factors. There's the traditional risk factors that are present across the general population, such as high blood pressure, too much salt in our diet, the development of atrial fibrillation, which is about at least one and a half fold higher in people with chronic kidney disease, troubles with lipid disorders and diabetes disorders. These also are associated with chronic kidney disease progression. The non-traditional factors are genetics, uh, susceptibility, what we call precision uh, medicine, where people are more specific to have a problem. So we want to tailor their care more precisely to that person. Uh, variations in vascular tone, oxidative stress, of course, uremia, uh, gout, endothelial or blood vessel wall dysfunction and mineral and bone disorders. All of these are risk factors for stroke. And if you come to my talk tomorrow, you'll hear there are many of these are risk factors for aging. Next, dialysis related factors. In other words, population that's on dialysis, getting up after dialysis quickly, uh, after being in the chair for four hours, when the blood pressure is lower because we've removed fluid, the patient may be more alkalotic, making them more susceptible to a seizure. And all of these things may potentiate a stroke in this population of patients. The use of erythropoietin in a patient who has high blood pressure can cause a stroke. Stiff blood vessels are associated with vascular calcification, and they too can lead to strokes. A big heart, and not a big heart like you're generous, but a big heart like you have bad disease in your heart, that can lead to a stroke. Chronic inflammatory states, and of course we mentioned vascular calcification. So a person who has dementia, a history of a stroke, or poor balance is at a high risk of falling. And they should be using a rollator or a wheelchair or a cane. These are all collectively caused assistive devices. Rollators may have four wheels. Uh, a walker may only have two wheels. So either one are useful. There's a difference in when you use one and when you use another. You would never use a rollator if a person has a severe balance problem because the rollator might get away from them. You need that traction. Whereas a person has weight bearing problems and they need something to help them control the, the weight, they're just not strong enough to stand. The walker that you see pictured here might be the right uh, tool. Next slide. The next thing I wanna talk about is medications. There are several kinds of medications, sleeping pills, sedatives, painkillers, diuretics, blood pressure medicines. Too much blood pressure control can cause people to have a chance of falling, especially if the blood pressures fall when they stand up, whereas they're normal when they're lying down. Over six medications per day increases the risk of falling. We call this polypharmacy. And the fall rate is about 31% in those people that have been followed with polypharmacy for over eight years. The risk of falls increases with insulin. So anybody who's taking diabetes medicines, particularly insulin, must be monitored closely. And so this is actually uh, information from the medical literature that is uh, available if you would like to read it or read further about the subject. 
sedatives claims data from 1,699,913 patients who were on Medicare, who were over 75 years old, had twice the number of falls when they were receiving a sleeping pill. The mortality rate was 15 times as high. So to be honest, I almost rarely, in fact, rarely prescribe sleeping pills to my patients anymore, especially diabetic and especially patients who have uh, kidney disease. What about fall-related medications? Well, this is a real-world challenge because many medications really help people, make them feel better, make them uh, control their diabetes. They do have benefits. So we have to be careful just saying to a patient, hey, we're going to take away all your medicines. We're not going to do that. Patients are very loath to give up their sedatives or their painkillers. Some patients may be addicted to them. So we have to be very strategic when we decide to reduce the number of medicines that somebody takes. The most important thing is to review medications and don't get the person to the state where they're on too many medicines to begin with. In other words, when your loved one is given a medicine or you're given a medicine, ask the doctor, say, do I really need this medicine? And ask the pharmacist. Chances are when the pharmacist tells you how much it costs, you'll probably ask him a second time because medicines are getting more and more expensive if you haven't noticed. Um, but many of these medicines have terrible drug reactions and uh, patients who do end up on medications need to be monitored very closely. And your caregiver, your doctor, your physician assistant, your nurse practitioner needs to work with you and your family because you may have fallen down. And so somebody around you needs to know what to expect. If your blood sugar is low, for example, how they may need to give you something to bring it back up, give you some sugar right away. Or if your blood pressure is low, they mean to do something to bring that back up. You may need a little saline, a little salt water, a little salty drink at home. Uh, you may need to lay down for a while at least. So needless to say, drug reactions. Uh, some people may need Narcan. They may be on a, a drug that has caused them to, uh, to require a, a, a reversal drug. And so this is a real world. And, and these, are, these are things that in the real world environment, we need to be aware of. In other words, this education and, and the questions that your doctor is answering for you can save somebody a lot. So this is why this is so important. Hypertensive medications. These are, uh, uh, can cause a fall. And so it's very important that we're aware of this. And if a person's had a fall recently and they're on blood pressure medicines, maybe we should look at the medications and maybe cut back a little bit and still monitor the blood pressure. The most important rule for medications is not from a doctor. This man is not a doctor. This man is probably the most world famous architect. His name is Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And uh, he started the concept of less is more. And you've seen many of his buildings around the world. And, uh, and his idea is simplicity and so it's very important to follow Mies van der Rohe's ideas. His most famous buildings in uh, New York City would be the Seagram building. And um, the most famous building he did in Chicago, I think everybody's familiar with, that doctors need to be, is the AMA building. It used to be the IBM building, but he designed the building for the American Medical Association. So. You may not remember Mies van der Rohe, but remember less is more, because that's what we're talking about when we're talking about medications. So let's talk about preventing non-mechanical falls. Okay, we talked about the 
two very important subjects, two important categories. Let's talk about the third category, which has to do with uh, changes in our body that might be related to medical disease or might be related to age. Vision, for example, that's you might uh, have diabetes, diabetic nephropathy, or glaucoma, or medical or macular degeneration, or a cataract, or just your vision may be declining. See the eye doctor. It's important to visit your eye doctor regularly because a lot of these diseases are preventable and treatable. Next, hearing and balance. As we get older, we get ringing in the ears or we lose our balance, we lose our hearing. So follow up with your ear doctor. They can send you to a balance program and help you uh, restore your balance quite a bit. These are very effective exercises that I've made a study of and they're fascinating. And, and you should consider, if you have any kind of balance problems, consider trying to uh, restore your balance. It's doable and it's well worth it. Next is gait and gait training. People who have neuropathy or a neurologic problem, uh, see the foot doctors, make sure that you're uh, not having any problems that can't be treated by the, the foot specialist, the podiatrist. Muscle weakness. Um, as we age, our muscles become weak. And it's important that we get into an exercise program and a walking program and a fall training program to keep our muscles strong. They don't have to get weak. And if we work at it, they won't. You just have to work at it. Uh, what about diabetes? The important thing with diabetes is don't overdo it. Don't overcorrect it. Now, it's a good idea to cut back on uh, eating raw sugar and carbohydrates and some of the foods that make diabetes worse. But uh, evaluate morbidities and, and, and look for some of the signs of diabetes and try to minimize them. Try to keep the blood sugars under good control. But like I said, you don't overdo the control. With cardiac, optimize management of arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation. If a person has atrial fibrillation, they may need a Watchman procedure or an ablation. They definitely need to be on anticoagulants if they're not having a Watchman because atrial fib without an anticoagulation can really potentiate a stroke. And heart failure itself can, can lead to a stroke. Kidney disease, well, this is our uh, whole topic uh, usually, uh, but you know, we always talk about diabetic and we talk about non-diabetics with kidney disease too, but we definitely want to control the diabetes. We want to control the blood pressure if the person's hypertensive. But in addition, we want to control metabolic acidosis, vitamin D deficiency, muscle weakness, nutrition, salt intake, and uh, we want to make sure that we're trying to prevent kidney disease from progressing. Dehydration, uh, here we're talking about access to fluids. We want to make sure that we are uh, drinking adequately, that we're not getting dehydrated because dehydration can very easily lead to uh, consequences. It can lead to a fall. Falls can lead to dehydration if you can't get up and you're isolated. And uh, too much of... Um, if, if uh, dehydration progresses, it actually leads to ill effects and, and can lead to death. So let's talk about mechanical falls. And uh, mechanical falls are things that um, kind of get in our way that uh, can make us fall. Like this bull, um, this is a 2,000 pound animal and this young man uh, has gone through extensive training, he knows he's going to fall, but he wants to prevent uh, himself from getting hurt when he falls. So we'll talk about that in a minute. What are some fall, fall prevention tips? Well, you know, you probably won't recognize the picture on the left, but it's from um, Morocco. And uh, this was, I uh, was recently there and um, we're very concerned because many of our friends uh, were caught in the earthquake. And this is a typical staircase in Morocco. And, uh, and you'll notice it, um, that it may have um, worn out tiles. This is a pretty rundown, worn out stair. 
So if your stairs are really run down and worn out, you have a higher chance of falling on them. So make sure if you have a carpet that it's secure. Use a walker, or cane, or hiking stick when outside or on rough terrain. There is no shame in using a, a walking stick. I know the chance of a fall is there, and I definitely don't want to take it. The next thing is handrails. When you walk up and down the stairs, use your handrail. And uh, walking up and down the stairs is good for you. It will help build your muscles up. And make sure you have a grab bar in your shower and use it. Um, I told somebody they needed a bar in their shower. And they started asking me about whether they should get gin or vodka. And I had to remind them, not that kind of bar. So you definitely want to get a bar in your shower, but not a wet bar. It'll be wet, but you want to get a bar that you can hold on to. It'll save your life. It's very important. Watch your step. Again, this is in Morocco, and uh, this was very easy to fall here. And um, because you're walking, the art is beautiful. The uh, These are very elegant, ornate buildings, and you're looking at them, and you're walking, and you could very easily uh, miss a step. I call these surprise steps. This is in um, Portugal, and this is, um, uh, no, this isn't in Portugal. This is in Tangier. This also is in Morocco. This is a, a staircase, and it it's looked pretty treacherous, but they did have handrails. And uh, it's very important whenever you go anywhere to use those handrails because they will make a difference. And stairs are everywhere. You can't avoid them. And uh, so it's important that you, uh, some stairs don't have handrails and uh, be careful on those. Try to stay away from them. Here's a, a stairs that uh, sort of has a handrail and uh, just have to be very careful. What about night lights? This is another thing. You can buy these very inexpensively and plug them in they last forever. They go out during the day. They come on at night. And uh, you're getting up uh, to go to the bathroom. A lot of people have to use a restroom at night. Or you get up for your uh, trip to the kitchen for your midnight snack. Make sure you have a nightlight. Review medications with your provider. Exercise. Use vitamin D. Stay out of bed. Consider balance exercises and even Tai Chi and have your eyes checked. So what about secure carpeting? This is a, a very beautiful Berber carpet from Morocco. And um, you can see that if it's all bunched up, it's just almost a guaranteed fall. And uh, you get to spend, you know, get your hip pinned in Marrakesh or something. It would not be a, a fun vacation. This is a brand of shoe that was developed by a man. This is a brand of soles developed by a man who lost a bunch of friends climbing a mountain in leather sole shoes. And he said, I'm going to invent the rubber sole. And when he did, he saved a lot of people. I've taken uh, most of my shoes and I put rubber soles on them. I put these kind of, of soles on them and it makes a tremendous difference. Uh, they're called Vibram soles, and these have good traction. So you got to be careful with good traction because if it's too good, then you'll stop short. So you have to be conscious and mindful. But this having good traction is very important. Always wear a hat when you walk. And um, this was um, taken by a, a professional photographer that was on a trip with me out in Big Bend. And uh, the thing of it is, is that when you walk somewhere, if you're wearing that hat and you fall down, the hat's going to take the blow, not your head. And so the hat's going to be the first force of impact. And it'll save your income because it'll save you a severe head injury. But it's always important to wear a hat when you're uh, walking or when you're riding a horse, when you're um, no matter what you do, it's just a good idea when you're outdoors to have a hat. And some hats now 
have uh, plates inside them. And that plastic plate would, when I'd fall, the plate would be the one that would take the impact, not my head. So you can buy those for like less than $20 and they're worth it. Clutter. Well, what we can do is when we take our clothes off and go to bed and we leave them all on the floor, then we get up in the middle of the night for either the, to go to the bathroom or to go to the kitchen and the, the clutter's down there and we just woke up, that's what we're going to trip over. So uh, you're going to stumble over the things you leave on the floor. So just move all that stuff off to a chair somewhere and get it out of the way. So here's a story. After a rough day of bull riding, the cowboy took off his boots, his wranglers, his shirt, his hat, and he threw them on the floor and he crawled into bed. He uh, awoke in the dark and got up and he tripped over his duds and he fell. And chances are he's a young cowboy. He'll be fine, but you might not be. So it's easier to be proactive and leave the clutter off the floor. Slippery floors. So you can actually grade the material that a floor is made out of and, and the traction it has and how well it'll uh, hold water. Certain rules provi um, uh, prevail in industrial uh, buildings and in commercial buildings that will prevent you from having material that's too slippery so that if it does get wet, you'll slip on it. Ramps have to be particularly uh, able to withstand traction and have good traction withstand somebody slipping. So a slippery floor is very dangerous. You can slip, lose your balance, and very easily fall backwards, hit a uh, part of your body, and then hit your head, and it's a very dangerous thing to do. So let's talk about exercise. Okay, there are we're going to talk about four kinds of exercise. There's lots of kinds. The first is aerobics. In other words, walking. Now, I'm not telling anybody to jog or run. You don't need to become an elite runner. You don't have to enter the Boston Marathon. But it's a good idea just to walk every day. Just get up and walk. Take a, take a nice walk, 15, 30 minutes. It'll just really help you. Uh, the next is resistance. That's lifting weights. Next is balance. That's lifting weights with one foot off the ground. And the next is recovery steps. That's lifting weights with one foot off the ground, falling and being able to step real quickly so that you don't hit the ground. So exercises are very, very important and they will help to keep you healthy. In fact, so much so that um, there's a system of exercises called the Otago exercises that were developed in New Zealand and are used for people that are frail to help them regain their strength. There have been several studies done, and each of these studies has shown that the, the incidence of falls is reduced when people get go through this Otago program. So aerobic exercises, this is getting on the treadmills. So Wherever you are, go to the gym, get on the treadmill. If you don't uh, go outside, take a walk in the neighborhood. Whatever you do, try to walk every day. It's really healthy to do that. The advantages of aerobic exercise as well, 200,000 nurses can't be wrong. Uh, they uh, exercise 30 minutes a day and lower the risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and breast cancer. Aerobic exercise improves diabetes, blood pressure, and weight control. It sharpens your thinking. It's fun. It reduces falls, hip fractures by about 55%. Walking is your best medicine. That goes back to Hippocrates. What's the value of exercise? Well, muscle mass declines with age. However, it can be preserved with just plain resistance band exercises. Balance exercises and core exercises help prevent falling. And Tai Chi may also be very, very helpful. So I recommend that we exercise every single day and not miss one day of working out with your balance, uh, working out with resistance bands, taking a little walk. 
So lose it or lose it or use it. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. What happens is if you're uh, an astronaut and you're in bed or in a chair or out in space with no gravity, signals are sent for your muscles to recycle because your body doesn't think you're going to need it. And so it basically recycles the muscle proteins to use somewhere else. And that's the same with renal failure, being bedridden, or it's the same as being in space. And you can avoid that with resistance exercises. In other words, they've developed vacuum exercise systems for uh, NASA so that the, the astronauts can exercise vigorously while they're up at the space station and out in space because they know by now how dangerous this is. So the question is, are you too old to exercise? Can you exercise? Should you exercise? Well, although a lot of people are thinking up their excuses, here's a 75-year-old nephrologist that you might recognize who exercises every day. And uh, if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, you're not too old to exercise. And my dad exercised till he was 90. So you know, exercise is something that you, you can do. I have uh, friends of mine that exercise. One's 93 and one's 90. Another one's 90. I have several older friends and they're always exercising. So that's the secret to staying young, in my opinion. You might hear more about this tomorrow. What about controlled trials? A controlled trial is, uh, they've, been, they've done 13 controlled trials in non-dialysis patients. The studies are small and short. They improve the quality of life. They improve GFR. They decrease blood pressure. They reduce the body mass index. Uh, and uh, they've done 27 randomized controlled trials in kidney patients and showed improved physical function. So people with kidney disease um, benefit from exercising. And don't forget, learn how to fall. You may not be as good as this cowboy in the rodeo, but try to figure out how to fall so that you don't hurt yourself when you do fall. And uh, there are several programs that teach that. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu, Judo, always, and Karate, always spend the first few weeks teaching you how to fall so that you roll with the fall and how you're able to block injuring yourself. I, uh, I think every kid's taken karate and it's very important that we maybe take lessons from some of the, the youngsters. So the rodeo in Houston is in February, although all summer long they have rodeos out in the hill country in Texas. And a cowboy has to stay on a bull that weighs 2,000 pounds for eight seconds. He is going to fall. And his chances of hurting himself are about 3.2%. Now, we older people have a 35% chance of a fall and a 50% chance of industry. So this young man really works hard to prevent a fall, shouldn't we? So just what can you do to pre prevent a fall? Well, there are several exercises. First of all, it's called recovery steps. So you lean forward until you're off balance or you have your trainer, if she's not busy taking your picture, push you until you're off balance. Then you step forward with the foot and then you're able to reestablish your balance. And you keep repeating this test from different positions. And once you do that, you will get the confidence to be able to catch yourself falling. And I've practiced this over and over and over again. And then not long ago, I was outside and I tripped over a curb and I was about to fall, but I caught myself and I didn't fall. There were some ladies standing by and they all looked and said, Ooh, are you okay? Are you all right? I looked at her and I said, Oh, we train for these things. So it's in the book I just wrote, uh, that uh, curb that I fell on uh, and, and almost hurt myself on. Uh, it was all camouflaged with shadows. So be very careful, number one, 
But if you are going to fall, know how to uh, protect yourself so that you don't hurt yourself. They teach that to parachute jumpers. They teach that to rodeo, football, uh, athletes all learn that. And there's no reason why you can't learn it too. It's not that difficult. And you just have to practice. Well, inner air balance, uh, this is called balance rock. So that's why I use the picture. But inner air balance declines with age. So what can we do to build our balance up? Practice. Stand on one foot first without the weights and then with the weights and then start squatting while you're holding the weights. That gets very tough. Or get on a BOSU ball and squat on the BOSU ball. And you, you won't be able to do it in the beginning, but uh, unless you're really, really a great athlete. But if you practice and practice and practice and practice, you will be able to balance. It does come back because it's your muscle memory. So what are the take home messages? Where are we closing out here? Number one, falls are common in the elderly and in people with kidney disease. Number two, they can be caused by underlying conditions like neurologic disorders, medications, or just deterioration in people with chronic kidney disease or chronic diabetes or other chronic conditions. There are many modifiable factors, vision, hearing, footwear, that can uh, contribute to a fall. So fall proof your home environment and get in shape. Uh, do aerobic exercises, resistance exercises, fall prevention exercises and balance exercises. Try to stay in shape. I would like to thank all of you for your attentiveness during this presentation. And I uh, would like for you to um, enjoy the rest of the uh, uh, presentations that you'll be hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fadum, for an excellent and important presentation. We appreciate your insights and your wisdom.